Christian church. Yeah, yeah, Merry Christmas. So, yeah, that's this week. Uh, And uh, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that we're able to worship together. Those of you who are at home watching online, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, Like I said, this month is crazy around here. Uh, We've got a lot of stuff going on. Just remember, immediately after the service today, if you are a member of First Christian Church, please stick around afterwards. We've got uh, we've got a budget or we're going to vote on the budget immediately afterwards. So it's a congregational meeting. Uh, And then after that, we've got a board meeting. So if you're a board uh, chair or member or or whatever, just make sure that you stick around uh, for a few minutes after that. So that's going to be back there. Then tonight, oh, tonight, 6 o'clock, we are going to be going to the refuge to support them and their ministry of what they have going on. At 6 o'clock, they're having their Christmas service. So if you want a Christmas service, head on over there because I'll be there, and I know a few others are going to be joining us as well. Um, So hopefully when you walked in, you grabbed one of the bulletins. Uh, I did most of the uh, uh, announcements already, but there's still a couple. when you leave and you're on your way out to the, the board meeting and, and so forth, if, uh, down in the foyer is sign-up sheets. We have people we need to have signed up for communion, children's church, nursery, uh, and Sunday school teachers. So we're hoping to kick that the Sunday school back off on Sunday mornings next month. Uh, so we need teachers. So we've got the materials. We've got everything you need. We just need you to sign up and help us out with that. So if you want to go down there and sign up, uh, please do. Um, and then also uh, the lamp lighter. If you have some announcements, if you have something that needs to go in, that needs to be into the office Wednesday. All right. So that that is going to have to happen. All right. I think. Oh, one more. I have a little post-it note here. And it says... All youth need to see Chris and Haley before leaving. I know what you're all saying. Who's Chris and Haley? There they are. All right. So uh, if you're here and you're the youth, you need to see Chris and Haley before you leave here today. All right. That is all of the announcements that I have. Do me a favor. Would you stand as we have our opening prayer? (laughs) Praise you, God. Thank you so much, Father, for all that you do for us. And I know that at this time of year when we come together and and we come together as a congregation, we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, we come to glorify you and to honor you and to praise you. And so when we come and we sing and we pray and we take communion, man, when we take communion, it's about that time where we, we recognize what Jesus did on the cross for us and we thank you, Father, for sending Jesus who died on the cross for us. But then we're also going to have the uh, the message and, and, and the fellowship that we have. And so, Father, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. <laughs> it's not about us. It never is. Once we start reading in the Scriptures, once we start understanding what our life is all about, it's about pleasing you and honoring you and glorifying you. It's not about us. And so, Father, when we come this morning and we come to sing and we come to pray and to glorify you, it's to lift your name on high and to say thank you, Father, for all that you do. And you alone are worthy to receive all of our praise and all the glory. And you are worthy to receive all the honor. Thank you, Jesus, for just loving us. Thank you for being a part of us. Thank you for dying on the cross for us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Find it hard to sleep tonight Resting by the Christmas lights Could there be something you forgot Beyond the rose and mistletoe The tree with presents right below There's more to this than you had ever thought Yeah. What is Christmas? If the 
song like that and it's about that time where we have to remember what this season is all about it's about him it's about jesus it's about god looking at you and looking at me and looking at us and looking at the world and saying man you guys needed a savior you needed a perfect lamb to be led to the slaughter for our sins and when we take communion, and we take communion on a weekly basis here, we have to remember that. He was the perfect lamb that led to the slaughter. That is why we take the bread and we take the, the, the juice to remember his body and his blood that was, re- uh, that was crucified for us. But I also know that when we come to communion, you have to be right here. And you have to be right here. I know that... <laughs> van likes to say hey you know you've got to make sure that you were in the right mode and the right mindset to be able to take this but where where does he get that from he's been talking about that and it comes from corinthians chapter 11 i'm just going to read this and i want you to pay very very close attention to this because there are some sundays i don't take communion because i'm not okay well some of you are thinking yeah you're not okay in your head but i'm not okay here and sometimes i'm not okay here so I don't take it because of this exact reason. Listen to this. Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, and he says in verse uh, chapter 11, verse 27, it says, So then, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. So when we take communion, we typically are confessing our sins to him and telling him that what we've, you know, what we've done and, and how we recognize him for being our Savior and forgiving us of our sins. And, and, uh, and then we take the body and the blood and we, we, we do that to remember what he's done on the cross for us. But if, if you're not focused and thinking about that when you take that, you're taking it in an unworthy manner, and you're sinning against the Savior, the reason for the season. Then he goes on. Verse 28, Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why so many of you are sick and weak, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Huh. Guys, before you come and you take this, and we have this prepared here and back there, really look and examine your heart. Examine your mind and say, am I in the right mindset, in the right manner in order for me to take this because you don't want to sin against his body whom you're trying to take this to remember make sense let's pray heavenly father i just want to thank you so much and we thank you jesus for all that you have done for us and 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 jesus when we come to this time in our service where we we have to think about your body and we have to think about your blood and and we have to think about your sacrifice that you made on the cross for us. It's, that is like the ultimate act of love that anybody could ever do. And so, Jesus, you have done that for us. And I know that 
before they took you away, you were praying and you said, Father, is there any other way uh, to, to have this happen? But if not, your will be done. And so you died on a cross for us. And we have to remember that. We have to think about that. This is not just something that we take and we do on a weekly basis just to, you know, just to throw it away. But we have to recognize your body. We have to recognize who you were and who you are for us as our Savior. And so we take this, this cup and we take this, this bread to remember you on the cross for us. We've got to remember you because of your love for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for us. Thank you for being obedient to our Father to the point of death. Thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Close your eyes for just a moment, please. Just for a moment. With your eyes closed, imagine shepherds in a field tending sheep. They are talking. They're discussing what kind of day they had. It's quiet. Then all of a sudden, open your eyes. There are angels everywhere. They're loud. They're proclaiming the birth of Jesus Christ. And they're rejoicing. And so you're not turned from quiet to you're scared to death for a minute. And then they're gone. And now it's quiet again. It's the silent night. It's that night that Christ was born. It's, it's that song that we sing this time of year when we should be singing it probably half a dozen times a year to remember the gift that was given to us that holy night. singing on that quiet and blessed night are very reminiscent of another time that we're going to see because there'll be a time when Jesus comes back that they'll fill the air and we'll join him up in the air we'll hear those angels sing for the rest of our lives we'll be with them we'll be singing we'll be praising God 24 hours a day the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king peace on earth and mercy mild God and 
and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time behold Him come, offspring of the virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as men with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all He brings, risen with healing in His wings. Mild He lays His glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King.
So it was about a week and a half ago, laying in bed, middle of night, and Heather screams out loud and starts flopping around on the bed. Wakes me up. It's like 2 in the morning, and I'm going. And she finally stops, and I'm like, okay, I'm awake. So I went out to the family room, turned on the TV, watched TV for about two hours. Now, this is a normal thing, not her screaming and waking me up, but I normally get up every night anyway and go out and watch TV until I get tired and go back to sleep. But the morning when her alarm went off, I asked her, I said, are you okay? What were you dreaming about last night? And she said, we were being attacked by a whale, and I was trying to fight them off, and I'm going, all right, all right, a whale. So now it's kind of funny because she'll have dreams and she'll wake up in the morning and she'll look at me and she goes, did I wake you up last night with my dream? I said, no, that was just a one-time thing. That was just a one-time thing. But a whale was attacking us. All right, all right. Well, Friday we went uh, grocery shopping. Um, there's a, a, a special meal that I want to cook one day this week and, and it was requiring uh, blue cheese. So I, I, I'm not a fan of blue cheese, don't like blue cheese, but I'm going to do this meal and I'm going to incorporate the blue cheese just like it says to. Uh, but the, the, we have found that the Kroger in Starkville has a huge cheese selection. And they don't just have blue cheese. They've got English blue cheese. They've got French blue cheese. They've got English blue cheese. They have all kinds of blue cheeses that were there. So we're standing there, and the lady comes over, and she goes, can I help you find something? And we're like, no, we're just looking for blue cheese. And she goes, well, this one does this, and this one does this, and this one does this. And so we're just picking them up and smelling, you know, the outside package of the cheese to see what it would be like. And she grabs one, and she goes, oh, this smells so good. And she hands it to me. And I take it, and I smell it, and I'm like, oh, it's pungent. I don't know. I don't want that. And so I'm looking for a milder kind of a blue cheese to go with this cheese sauce that we're talking about making. So we finally agree on one. And she picks up another one, and she goes, ooh, this smells real good. Tiny little wedge like this, you know. And then she looked at the price, and it was $16, and she goes, <laughs> So this one was like four for this wedge. We're like, that's the one we're going to do. Ask me later next week if the cheese sauce turned out good. All right. So, uh, and maybe I'll share it with you. All right. So, um, uh, Thessalonians. All right. So turn to the book of Thessalonians. And one of the things I wanted to, or, and I told you about this week, uh, when we were, when I did the weekly update, this is Paul. Uh, having to talk to the church in Thessalonica uh, to make sure that they understood and what they were going on. And Paul, when, when you read this book in Thessalonians, um, you could just tell that there was a soft place in his heart for this church. You can tell that he loved this church, he loved them, he wanted what was best for them. And some of you are going, oh, I can't wait for him to get to chapter 4. I'm not doing chapter 4 today. All right, I've done that before, but now look at chapter 2, and you're going to see this. I'm trying to think of the way to put it. You're going to see the relationship that Paul has with the people in Thessalonians. You're going to see that relationship that he has with the church in Thessalonica. It becomes quite evident in chapter 2. Did I pique your interest a little bit in that chapter? I hope so, because this is what it says. All right. Starting in verse 1. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi. And as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you the gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal... Uh, we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. So Paul is going, listen, I know that the, 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 the way that we were treated in Philippi uh, and for the church in the, uh, the Philippians, 
You know, we read that just a few weeks ago. He's like, well, listen, there was great opposition for us to go and talk to them. And so, but we knew that it, uh, we were hoping that when we came to you, that you would be more receptive to this and, and you'd be more open to hear what we had to say. And there were great results there. Here's one of the things that I want to remind you about when you read this and when you were looking at this is that there are going to be times where you are trying to share the gospel with someone and it doesn't work out. What happens when you try something and you try to talk to someone about the gospel and it doesn't work out? What do we do? We shut down pretty much, don't we? We're like, well, that didn't work. I'm not, did you see the way they laughed at me? Did you see the way they talked bad about me? Did you see the way this all happened? And, and because of this, I'm not going to go share with anybody else because look what happened to me there. Look what happened when I went to Philippi. Look what happened when that happened. Look what happened when I was talking to people uh, at Phillips Hardware or at, or at the co-op or at, at Sunfresh or whatever the case may be. You know, what happens when I share? They rejected me. Then, then what do you do? Take the dust off your feet and you move on to the next person. You move on to the next thing. And, and you start sharing with them because you don't know if you're going to be like run into the church like in Thessalonica where they were receptive to this and, and they were helping him and they were loving on him. Let's go on and it says this. On verse 4, on the contrary, we speak to those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. You know we never use flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or in, uh, anyone else, even, through the apost- even though the apostles of Christ, uh, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. <laughs> hey, listen, we, we're, we're not, we weren't trying to do this for the glory. We weren't trying to trick you into anything. We weren't trying to have you see things a certain way. We were just trying to share the gospel with you, and we were trying to be with you so that you understood what it was like. And so we were just there doing this because this is what God wanted us to do. We wanted to live this way. He, here's... Here's a, a thought, here's a, here's a process, here's a transition that all of us need to try to make when, when, when it comes to living this Christian life. I have been talking with you for the last several weeks about this journey that we're supposed to be on where we're supposed to be united in a brotherhood, where it's a contract, a covenant that you've made to, to be like Jesus, to live the way that he wants you to live and to do the things that he wants you to do. And one of the things that we see that Jesus did when he was living and and being among the people, he didn't care what other people, he didn't care what other people were thinking. He just wanted to please his father. He just wanted to please God. Didn't matter what other people thought of him. I just have to please my father and and Paul is saying the same thing to them. Listen, listen, we, we weren't there to, to please people. <laughs> because what happens when you share the gospel with people? They're going to get offended. They're going to get hurt. They're going to get rejected. Because when we do what this says that we're supposed to do, when we're living the way that God wants us to live, when we're living the way that Jesus wants us to live, when we're living the way that the Holy Spirit is prompting us to live, when we're living the way that our Heavenly Father wants us to live, a lot of the stuff that we're doing in this is contrary to what we think. It's contrary to what we believe sometimes. And so when we look at this and we're living our lives, we have to ask ourselves this one simple question. Is this pleasing to God? And if it's pleasing to God, then you do it. I hear a lot from people how they can never do something. We need you to teach a Sunday school class. Oh, I can never teach a Sunday school class. We need you to go and make disciples. 
because Matthew 28 tells us to. Oh, <laughs> I can't ever talk to people about this. I, I, that's just not me. It's not in me. Um, when, when someone is caught in sin and you know about it, you're supposed to go and talk to them about it to help them through their sin. Oh, <laughs> I can't do that because I'm not perfect myself and I can't do that. And so here's what I'm getting at. When we read in Matthew and we go all the way through the book of Revelation, he has given you the authority. He's given you the power. He will give you the words and the actions. He will take you step by step through the process to do what he wants you to do. Who is the one that is whispering in your ear, <laughs> you, you can't do that. Who's the one that's telling you in your ear, you're not good enough for that? Who's the one whispering in your ear, you don't have enough Bible knowledge to do that? Who's the one that's whispering in your ear, they're going to make fun of you if you do? Who's the one whispering in your ear, all of these negative things to stop you from doing what God wants you to do. Satan is. The demons are. Because when you listen to those negative things that stop you from doing the things that are pleasing to God, because you don't, because you, you're, you're afraid of doing all these things that God wants you to do, you pull away from this. You pull away from what the scripture is telling you to do. So it's not about pleasing men, it's about pleasing God and doing what He wants you to do. All right, let's go on. Now I got to find myself. Where am I? I got to find the right book. Hang on, I'll find the right book. Then He goes, Okay, look at that thing in verse 7. What does He say? Instead, we were like, Yeah, among you. All right, so he's like, hey, this is our relationship that we had with you. We were like little children among you so that we were all on the same page. We came to you. We started talking with you. We started sharing with you. We started loving on you, and we're going to get to that too. But we were just like you. We were at your level so that we can be a part of you so that you get to know who we are. Then he goes on. All right. Then he goes on. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, we, uh, so we cared for you. All right, we were children among you, and now he's talking about how he's a nursing mom to them. Hey, you know how a nursing mom is? You see how a nursing mom is? Man, they're holding the baby, they're, they're, they're feeding the baby, they're protecting the baby, they're changing the baby, they're helping the baby along the way. A nursing mom is right there. And so the nursing mom knows every three hours, every four hours, I've got to feed the baby and feed the baby. I got to burp the baby. I got to change the baby's diapers. I got to do all sorts of stuff. And I got to hold the baby and love on the baby and give a baby bath. I got to do all that. And he says, listen, that's what we had to be for you too. So we could be that mother for you to help you through this process. So we cared for you because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardships. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each other, uh, we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. <laughs> now, now we've transitioned again, right? We were with you as kids. We loved on you as a nursing mom did to help you through this process. And now he's saying, listen, now, 
Do you remember? We also had to treat you like a father. And how does a father treat his kids sometimes? With discipline, right? We got to discipline. He goes through and talks about all these things, but a father is a different person. When you're out there and you're little and uh, you skin your knee or you hurt yourself, who's the first person you call out to? Mom, right? Mom! Mom goes, what, what? Comes out and helps you. Oh, yeah, well, let's go in and bandage you up. Let's help your scraped knees and your elbows and you've got a busted lip. Oh, mom. Oh, come on in. Let's do this. And when mom's not around, what does dad do? Get up. Man, what do you just get out there? You're come on. My mom, who's probably going to watch this later, she had an old saying. She had a saying that we had growing up. My mom, that was here just a few weeks ago. So uh, she always said this. If it doesn't bleed, it doesn't hurt. That was her saying. My sister and I were playing ball in my bedroom. I had bunk beds, and she was on the floor. I was on the top bunk, and she decided to see how low she could toss it to see how far I'd reach over to grab it. I was four. I reached over to grab it, fell off, broke my left arm. My sister's laughing at me as I walk out into the family room, and my parents had to take me to the doctors to get my arm cast. It didn't bleed, but it hurt. <laughs> and at one point, my dad and my mom, when they were married and they were adding on to the house, my dad's hammer fell from the ladder and hit my mom in the head. She started crying. She was hurt. And my dad said, if it doesn't bleed, it doesn't hurt. Anyway, the divorce happened not too long after that. All right. Now, I have no idea how long after. But anyway, so let's go on. All right. Um, verse 11. For we know that we have dealt with each other as for you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of the, of the call, uh, uh, worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. All right. So he's saying, okay, now we've got this. So now we're encouraging you. Now we're helping you. Now we're helping you grow. We, we, we were children. We were a mom. And now we're father figures. And father figures sometimes have to be harder on, your, on the kids to help them grow. Then he goes on. Verse 13, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a, a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea. We are all in Christ Jesus. You suffered for your own people. Uh, the same way those churches suffer from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they have been saved. In this way, they also heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. But brothers and sisters... When we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy in the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Ha! <laughs> All right, so... Here's one of the things I want you to look at here. Here's one of the things I want you to examine. I want you to think about this. With all of the stuff that we've been re reading so far, all the things that we've been learning our whole lives over the last three and a half years that I've been here, over the last several months as we finally got into the New Testament, Paul is looking at this and saying, you are our glory because you follow after Christ. You are our glory because you are following after God. And 
we have to look at ourselves, examine our hearts, examine our minds, and think, are we living like the glory of God wants us to? Do, do, do your co-workers believe and know that you are a follower of Christ? Do your neighbors know and believe because of your example? Do those who see you walking in the street or into stores, is your example at that level where they know who you are and what you believe? Are you at that level where you are living the life of glory that God is expecting from you? <laughs> I think if we are really just looking at ourselves and truly being honest with ourselves, honestly we can say, no. It's not because I'm a pastor, not because I'm a minister, not because of my role here, but I've always tried to live my life as an example for those around me. Even when I was selling cars, working at a car dealership, selling Cadillacs and Mercedes, I, I wanted to make sure that I was living at that level so that the people around me knew I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't take cussing very well in my little cubicle that I had. And I remember a young man coming in my office, and he wanted to talk to me about something, and he said a cuss word, and I said, ah, 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 you don't do that in here. So he took one step back out of my cubicle and still talked to me through it, you know, but he, they knew. People knew when I was working there. They knew. They knew I was a pastor. They knew I was a Christian. They knew I went off and prayed. They knew I was reading my Bible. They knew all these things. And I wasn't embarrassed about it. I was happy about it because they knew. And when I was working at the dot-com company, they knew. Because I wanted them to know and I wanted to live that life that was an example for those around me so that they could look to me and grow. And when that one young man who was in his early 20s came to me and he says, I want you to know that I'm an atheist. I said, okay. And I, he goes, so what do I do about it? And I said, well, how much research have you done into being an atheist? And he goes, uh, none. I said, oh, okay, so what other religions have you studied? And he goes, none. I said, so how are you an atheist? You haven't even done any of the research. How do you know what's out there? And he goes, I, I, I don't. I said, man, I know of a great book that you could read. And I didn't tell him about the Bible yet. But it's called The Case for Christ. You need to read that because it's about a man who was an atheist. And said he wanted to research enough to know if what they said about Christ in the Bible was true or not. So he started doing research. He's got historical documents. He's got all sorts of stuff that talk about Christ. He's going from the Old Testament into the New Testament. And he was reading and he was studying and he was learning and he was writing this book. You know what happened to that gentleman by the time he finished that book? He became a Christian. And he became a pastor. And he was a pastor in one of the largest churches in Chicago, Illinois for many, many years. But our you comfortable enough for people to come up and talk to you about things like that? Well, I, I don't know enough about that. You don't know enough about that. There's just no way I can talk to people about my walk with Christ. There's no way you don't know enough about your walk. Hey, maybe you should come up with a story to tell people about how you became a Christian and, and what God has done for your life. There's no way I can come up with a story about how what God did for my life and how he changed me and about Jesus. There's just no way, right? But we're supposed to live this way. And are you? You need to be 
that childlike person with people who are just coming to know who Jesus is. You need to be that mother figure like they had to be to nurture and to help and to feed and to grow those who come to know who Christ is. And you also need to be that father, father figure and tell them and discipline them and love on them and encourage them as a father figure. That is all of our jobs. That is your role. How are you living it? All right, our song of invitation that we have today, uh, it is that beautiful name. If you need anything, if you need prayer, if you need something, as we have this song of invitation, if you want to come down and meet me right here, that would be amazing. I'll be standing right here, but let's go ahead and stand as we sing that beautiful name. Beautiful name that angels brought down to earth. They whispered it low one night long ago to a maiden of lowly birth. That beautiful name, that beautiful name from sin has power to free us that beautiful name that wonderful name that matchless name is jesus the one that that name my savior became my Savior of Calvary. My sins nailed Him there, my burdens He bare. He suffered all this for me. That beautiful name, that beautiful name, from sin has power to free us. That beautiful name, that wonderful name, that matchless name is Jesus. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you so much for just loving on us the way that you do and, and how you just help us to grow through every stages of our walk with you and, and how we need to live that way that we can just be glorifying you and, and not have to worry about other people, just living to live a life that is worthy of the call that you have given us. And Father, I'm asking that you help us to remember, even though Christmas is this week, that it's really about the birth of our Savior Jesus and let us remember that as we celebrate. It's beautiful to be around family. It's beautiful to be around friends. It's beautiful to have these gifts and the presence and to see the look on, uh, on loved ones' faces as we receive and give gifts. Hmm. But the best gift that we've ever received is Jesus. Not only is his birth, but also for his death, which gives us freedom from sin. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.